at least one tip if I can. So let's go ahead and switch over to the desktop before I put you back in the main lobby and we wait for the mainstream. Uh, so I see Kathleen already over there on YouTube just waiting for a quick tip. So let's go ahead and do this real fast. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my desktop. Um, I've got Photoshop open. And one of the things that um, it's, a, it's an old tip. It's not something new by any means. But it's getting Photoshop out of your way. Meaning I, I want to just see my image. I don't want to really see the, the menus, the bars, or anything else around it. Now, there's two ways to do this. If you just need something quick, and this works in both Photoshop and Lightroom, you just hit the Tab key, and that kind of turns off just your panels. But you still see anything at the top. You still see anything at the bottom. Um, but just tab on, tab off, and that will quickly get rid of any panels that you're looking at. However, if you want to quickly get rid of everything and just focus on your image, then you can hit the letter F and that'll go full screen, hit it again, and that'll completely go full screen. And then you can, you can even work. You still have your tools to work in Photoshop, but if you wanted someone to quickly come over and look at your monitor and they, you didn't want them distracted by the Photoshop interface, you can just simply hit that letter F and that will take that away. So they only see, um, they only see your image. Basically, they only see the, the image you're working on or zoomed. You can even zoom in at this level. So if you want to zoom in, hold down your space bar and pan around, you can kind of give them a preview without the rest of the interface being in, in, in view. So hitting the letter F again will take you all the way back. And so it's F, F, F will keep toggling you through all three of these modes until you get back. So that's our quick tip. Um, I'm going to put you back put you guys back in the lobby just for a few seconds and then we'll kick off uh, the main stream over on Adobe Live right at the top of the hour. And uh, thanks guys for being here and I see a good afternoon from Amos and uh, Kathleen, thanks for being here in the pre-stream. We'll see you guys in just a minute. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Masterclass Friday. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist for Adobe. It's my pleasure to be here streaming to you live once again on a good Friday morning, my time, afternoon or evening, your time, perhaps. But uh, I'm glad to have you here no matter what. Now, um, just in case, I noticed that YouTube was doing some weird things with the streams today. So uh, hopefully this is coming across OK. Uh, hopefully you guys are seeing everything the way you should, and I'm sure um, the moderators will tell me if not, but I don't know what else I can do about it. Like YouTube's just doing weird things today. But anyway, um, we're going to pick up where we left off. Actually, it was two weeks ago. Um, two weeks ago, we um, did it, or I did a Lightroom and Photoshop tips and tricks. As usual, I had more tips than I had time for, so we kind of ran out of time. And I, uh, I wanted to go ahead and uh, do this as a part two. It was just popular demand. You guys liked it so much. So I decided to go ahead and come back and do this as a part two as well. So with that said, um, we're going to uh, do a part two of uh, Lightroom and Photoshop tips and tricks. I'm going to do it just like I did two weeks ago where I divided the time in half. So half Lightroom, half Photoshop. So they get equal time. Um, also with that said, uh, if, um, if you're, oh, there we go, I was going to say, if you're watching this somewhere else, if you're watching this on another channel, you're watching this on YouTube, that's cool, but, uh, I won't see your questions. In other words, if you want to participate in the chat, head over to b.net slash Adobe live. That's the chat I'm uh, monitoring. That's the one I'm looking at. And I see Victoria, Tim, Michael, William, Jennifer, Sean, uh, Tracy, Susan, JR, and Livingston all there just saying hello to everybody right now. And so that's the chat that I'm going to be focused on for the rest of this stream. Um, so with that said, uh, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live, or you can hang out where you are. You just, I won't see your questions or comments. Uh, also, if you're watching this on the replay, thanks for watching the replay. I love replay numbers just as much as I love live numbers too. So 
Uh, also, thanks for catching the replay. So with that said, let's dive into the remainder of the tips. Again, starting with Lightroom, we'll do Lightroom for about 20 some odd minutes and then we'll finish up with Photoshop for the rest of the time. I'm looking at the time. When we get to the halfway point, I'll try to remember to switch over. All right, so with that said, uh, let's go ahead and dive over to the desktop. I've got Photoshop open, but we're gonna go ahead and quickly switch to Lightroom. And actually the first Lightroom tip is one that came from last week's or two weeks ago session and it was um, a question on if they asked uh, i forgot who she was but she said could you please show how to do watermarks and i was like gladly because that adds another tip so i'm going to start off with the watermark tip um, how to do i'm going to show it to you in both applications both lightroom classic and lightroom the other one and that way you'll get to see how it works in both ones and you'll get to see where you apply it um, I think that was it. I think that was all I had to say. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so I got, uh, you need at least one or more, well, actually you don't really need an image selected, but it would help if you're designing your watermark for the first time. All right, so in the Lightroom Classic environment, under the Lightroom menu, there's something called Edit Watermarks. And when you go there, you have a choice of either text-based watermarks so watermarks that you um, you can just type whatever you want in whatever font you want, so forth and so on. And uh, it will default to copyright in your Adobe ID name. So it's already defaulting to copyright Terry White. And you can even see it down there in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. That's what it would look like on the image. And so you get some controls. You get to choose the font. Like I said, you could choose its Myriad Web Pro regular. Uh, you can size it up if you want it to be bigger and obnoxious and take away from your photography. This is a joke, but it's real life. Don't do that. Uh, you can make it, uh, of course, not obnoxious, but still visible. And you can even uh, say that it will always fit the image no matter what. So that means that no matter how big that image gets, the watermark will just keep getting bigger. I like proportional instead, where it's basically proportional based on that size that I set no matter how big the image gets, it will always be proportionally that size. Uh, you can make it horizontal or vertical. You can anchor it in any one of the corners. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to see if it was here. It is, oh, shadow. Yes, this is an important one because notice my watermark is white. Well, what if, it, what if the background of the image was white? Then you wouldn't see it. Like it would be a useless watermark at that point. So what you want to do is enable shadow so that you get a drop shadow behind your, your watermark that no matter what color the image is that's behind it, it will always show. So I love having shadow turned on for that. And you can choose the opacity of the watermark. So I typically do my uh, watermarks at not 100. I typically ghost them out a little bit. So they're still there, but they're not, um, they're not, uh, so, so in your face, so to speak. And then once you get all this set the way you want, you can go up here to the presets. You can save it as a new preset. So I've got a few of them here. TW, all these TWPs are my various watermarks. And, um, and then that way it will appear as whatever you named it in all the menus for exporting and using it. All right, uh, Jan, <laughs> great to see you here. Um, so with that said, now let's talk about my favorite kind, which I don't really use the text ones anymore. I use mostly the graphic ones because with a graphic watermark, you can actually go find your logo. And I highly recommend you choose like a ping file, PNG, because a ping file can have transparency. So that way they'll be able to see through your logo um to your back to your background as opposed to just a big white square or a different color square unless your logo is a square uh, so uh same thing proportional you get all the options but what you don't get here is you don't get the option for drop shadow so if you're going to make a graphical watermark you should probably go into photoshop and add a drop shadow to it if your drop shadows you know or, or if your image or your logo is white or whatever so that way it will always show no matter what color the background is but if your logos, you might want to make multiple watermarks because if your logo is, let's say, black and it was a black background on the image, then the drop shadow is not going to help you there. So you need to make a logo basically that shows up no matter what color the background is. That's my tip for designing what your watermark logo would look like. So I use white 
with a drop shadow in Photoshop as a saved out as a transparent ping. Then I bring it in and I saved it as uh, TWP stamp 70, which means it's normally 70% opacity, but I've been messing with it. So that's why it says edit it. All right, so once you go design it and you save it as a preset, you save it, name it, whatever, uh, then you cancel out of this. Now you get to use it all throughout the interface or all throughout Lightroom. So if I go up to my file menu and I choose export, and by the way, um, I want to make, I want to, um, well, one thing, one thing at a time, because I'm going to do a preset thing too. All right, but let's say I want to export this out for, um, for a web gallery. Uh, there we go. I can choose to include my watermarking. So down here at the bottom is a checkbox, and you can you know, normally be unchecked, but you can then check it and choose which one of those saved watermarks you did so that it will... Um, be exported out on all your images. So for example, if I were to choose that preset with a watermark with all the other things going in and I hit export and I overwrite the one that was already there and it exports that file out and it takes me to the operating system where it shows it to me and I'm gonna go there now and there it is. I can move it over so you guys can see it and there it is. So we see it with the watermark um, that I told it to export with. And if I export one image, I get one image with a watermark. If I export 100 images, I get 100 images with watermarks. Uh, so watermarks are, that's what they're, that's what they, that's how they work in Lightroom Classic. So I see Murray asking a question. When you export, do you watermark all my pictures? So he's asking me personally, I assume, and the answer is not anymore. I used to be big on watermarks, not from a protection standpoint, because watermarks don't really protect you. Like someone that knows Photoshop can easily get rid of that watermark. So stop thinking it's protecting your images. What I was using it for mainly was for branding. So if I do, if you ever see me export an image with a watermark, it's mainly because I want to, to be branded. Like this is a Terry White image kind of thing. Um, but then I kind of just learned that, you know, watermarks are kind of, it's a personal choice. Some people love them, need them, do them all the time. And others, uh, I've learned from just, if you watch most professional photographers, they don't do that because they think that, you know, they're, they're basically trying to make their style the branding. In other words, I can look at an image and know that that's so-and-so's image just because of the way they process it or the way they shoot it or the way they compose it. So um, I don't watermark. <laughs> what do I think of watermarks in general? I, I, I'm explaining that now. Um, I, 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 it, it's, it's kind of a, if I'm doing a web gallery for a client and I just want to remind them that, you know, these are unedited and they shouldn't be using them. That's when I kind of use a watermark, uh, in that gallery or, you know, as I'm, as I'm giving proofs out kind of thing, but not on the final images. I just don't, I, I used to do it all the time. I used to do it on every single Instagram post. I don't do it anymore. So it, it's, it's really up to you. And if, again, if you're thinking, hey, this is going to stop someone from stealing and reusing my image, it won't. <laughs> because if somebody really wants to steal your image, you're either going to have to make the watermark so obnoxious that someone can't enjoy the photography, or it's going to be relatively simple to take off or crop off. So stop thinking it's protecting you because it's really not. Um, if you want to protect your images, copyright them. You know, register copyrights with your images with your local government, and that will protect your images, or at least you'll be able to get retribution if someone uses your images commercially without your permission because you copyrighted them. The watermark doesn't do that. All right, so that's my take on watermarks. I said I would show you how it works in uh, Lightroom Cloud, so let's go ahead and switch over to that. Same kind of thing. It's, a, it's, it's, a, well, it's a part of the export process, but you don't design it until you do, do an export. So uh, if we go up to our export option and we choose not any of these kind of preset ones, we just go to the new standard export, um, then you notice that there is now a check mark for include watermark. Uh, and then you have a gear icon to go customize that watermark. So right now it's just defaulting to whatever I typed in last, Terry White Photography. I can go in here and change what it says. I can do all the kinds of things I mentioned, include a drop shadow, change the color, uh, size it up, so forth, change the opacity, all of those things I talked about. Um, but the difference here, currently in the cloud version, is that it's only text today. 
there's they haven't implemented the graphic version of it yet so no logos in lightroom cloud just text uh, lightroom classic lets you do either one all right um yeah, and as Tim's saying, it's not going to stop someone in country XYZ from slapping your work on a, on a shirt and selling it. So uh, the watermarks don't protect. They, they're they are reminders and they're branding, but they're not, oh, if I watermark my images, no one can steal them. So don't think that because that's just not true. All right, next up, um, and this was what I was getting to as far as presets are concerned. Uh, I was going to get into a preset thing with the watermarks, but it's a separate tip. So let me keep it as a separate tip. And that is... Um, if you export images out from Lightroom Classic on a regular basis, which I do, then I, I, I highly encourage you create export presets. So that's one tip. And then in the newer versions of Lightroom Classic, you now have the ability to export with multiple presets. So what, do, what does that mean? So let's say I want to export this image for two reasons. I want to export one out for Instagram and I want to export one out for print. Those are two different sizes, resolutions, so forth and so on. Or maybe I want one exported watermarked and I want one exported not with a watermark. So again, make up your own reasons. And it could be more than two presets. Maybe you want an Instagram photo that's not watermarked, a web gallery photo for your website that is watermarked, and a high quality print that's not watermarked. Again, it doesn't have to just be two. It could be multiples, any two or more. So first, let's go design a preset to see how that tip or that process works. File export. And then I'm gonna, I, I realized I didn't really have one called for print. I, I, as you can see, I use a lot of presets, but I don't really have one called for print. So let's go ahead and make that preset. So I'm gonna just go ahead and first of all say for uh, print, that's the folder it's going to put it in. I'm gonna put it in my, I don't wanna put it in that folder. You know what, hang on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's let's fix this. This is where it should start. Okay, so I want to put this in a folder called for print. And um, uh, yeah, if there's an existing file, ask me what to do. No need to change the name. I've probably already done that. File format, I definitely want JPEG and I want it to be Adobe RGB for the color space. 100% uh, quality because it's for print. And um, I used to resize images down, and now I don't, because if I'm shooting a 48 megapixel image, I want the highest resolution for print. So I'm not gonna resize it down at all. Now sharpening, I do wanna do some uh, output sharpening, and I usually do like for matte paper um, high, because I do want the, the sharpening to happen for a high, high res print. Uh, metadata is really not that relevant for this because it's really not designed to go on the web. This is for print. So it, 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 when you're done now, before I click export, cause it will do it, I'm going to go ahead and do one extra step and that's click add and then name this preset for print because now I will finally have that for print preset that's set up the way I want. So now if I were to go ahead and export this the way it is, um, it'll export a high res version of that. It'll probably throw it in a window on my other monitor when it's done. And oh, there it is. And there's my high quality print, no watermark, full resolution, whatever I had ready to go. Okay, but what if I needed, like I said, those two? So this is the next tip. I need uh, to use multiple um, presets. So you'll notice that when you go to export now and you've made presets, there's now a checkbox next to each one that wasn't there um, like a year ago. So now I can say for print and I can say uh, for web gallery with a copyright because I have one without, one with. So web gallery with a copyright. So that'll give me both of those. Uh, some sections are hidden when presets are, yeah, that's fine. All right, so uh, batch export. So now it says batch export instead of export. And when I choose batch export, um, doo -doo -doo, ooh, I get some new choices. I didn't know these were here before. Oh, this is cool. All right, uh, they, they, I think they recently added that. Anyway, but um, I'm cool with those options. You notice it's doing two things now instead of one. So it's exporting both files out and um, it's probably not going to show them to me because they, they, because I did the batch thing. Okay, wait. Oh, it is showing to me. Okay, here's the one for print, and I'm just going to drag over the one for web gallery. So there's the one for. Uh, yep, cancel. Oh no, I do want to do that. Sorry. 
That's what happens when you acknowledge the dialog box that you didn't read. All right, so anyway, there's the one for print. And here's the one, the smaller one for web gallery with a copyright. So you have uh, the option for using multiple um, presets to export out hundreds or thousands of images, all the various ways you need them exported. Because typically when I'm doing photography work, if there's a client or model or makeup artist or someone involved, I need to deliver at least two types of files, one for me, one for them, one for maybe watermark, maybe not watermark, maybe high res, maybe low res, maybe Instagram, so forth and so on. I'll just make all those presets and then export them all out the way I need. All right, next tip. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Okay, this is an editing tip. So let's go to my buddy Sean here. I've got Sean open. Let's go to develop. And you'll notice that in your basic panel, you've always had a, um, a white slider and a black slider. Now you notice I just, I, I click, I double clicked and they jumped to a number. Well, that's, that's not normal. Like <laughs> normal when you double click, it resets it back to zero. Why did mine jump to a number? Because I was holding down a key when I did it. So if you hold down your shift key, in Lightroom, when you double click your white or your black, what you, um, it, Tim, again, it, it could be, it could be um, YouTube, because like I said, YouTube's been giving me an issue starting this morning. So the buffering, I don't know, let's see. All right. Uh, hopefully you guys are still seeing this. I, I do see the buffering issue on YouTube, but I also see me still talking. So <laughs> hopefully it, it will continue. Uh, all right. Uh, again, I, I, it's YouTube. It's a, it's a day with YouTube today. Anyway, let's um, get back to the tip. So uh, the whites and blacks have a special function behind them. If you hold down the shift key, you get the ability to... Um, to have Lightroom decide or open up your, your whites and blacks to basically give you the um, dynamic range you're looking for. So for example, if you, um, or not dynamic range you're looking for, the, the maximum, the, pos, the dynamic range that Lightroom thinks it should be in your image. So in this image, it, it, it basically moved them both to the right. If I were to go out and find a image that maybe wasn't so dark, um, let's find this one and let's go to develop and same thing. Let's do shift blacks and shift whites. Um, it, see it move the black one to the left a little and the, and the whites to the right a little. So it's basically opening up. Hey, Jason, uh, Jason, it's, it's a buffering YouTube kind of day, but anyway, um, it, it opens up the dynamic range on those images um, based on the image. So it, it, these sliders will always move in different numbers, different directions. It just depends on um, the image that you're working on. So that's a tip. Just hold down your shift key. Let Lightroom pick your dynamic range by double clicking both handles. Shift double click white, shift double click black, and it will set those points for you. All right, um, next up. Let's go to our next tip, which is going to be uh, adjustment brush presets. This is another one that people uh, tend to not know about um, a lot. So let's, and I get questions on it when I show it because I have a bunch of presets and people are like, where did all those come from? Or what are you using them for? What, blah, blah, blah. All right, so if you go to your adjustment brush, You'll notice that, um, well, basically, I take that, not the, not the eyedropper, if you go to the adjustment brush, you'll notice that um, at the very top, there's an effect and then there's a pop-up menu. And those pop-up menus are presets. Now, all the ones above this line are built into Lightroom. So you have all these. You have temperature, tint, exposure, so forth and so on. You have all these. What are they for? And why would you, why would you care? Because you, you're going to drag the sliders any way you want. What I love about the presets in the, um, in the adjustment brush or in the local adjustments 
is that when I choose one, let's say I just wanted to brighten up um, part of her neck, for example, then I could just jump to exposure. And by jumping to that preset, what I'm telling Lightroom to do, not so much increase the exposure because that number may not be what I want, but mainly what it's doing is it's zeroing out everything else. So it's, it's saving me the time of having to say, oh, I didn't, really didn't want saturation. I didn't want texture. I didn't want clarity. I didn't want all those things that were on from last time. I'm basically saying uh, turn off everything and just focus on exposure. So for example, if I were to say, oh, I wanted um, her, her lipstick to be more saturated. If I go to saturation, then it turns off everything else but increases saturation. So that's the main reason I use presets in my adjustment brush or any other local adjustments because it turns off everything else more so than turning on what I need. Uh, now, you notice I have a bunch of presets. These are all mostly third-party presets. I found uh, some person made a bunch of presets for the adjustment brush. I got these a long time ago. I can't even remember where I sourced these from, but uh, I've been I've been happy with <laughs> like you can see I have a lot. Uh, some of these are from the Wow series, um, and then the rest of these are just like all of these um, retouching ones are from a person that just made a bunch of retouching um, adjustment brush presets. So for example, if I again go back to just exposure, it will then let me um, start brushing with exposure and nothing else. And again, that is the, maybe that's not the amount of exposure I want it, but I can certainly then dial it back to just what I need it or dial it up to just what I need it. But I didn't have to worry about anything else being on. So that's why the presets are important. Okay, next up, uh, next tip. Uh, solo mode. So, um, If you right click on any of your develop module panels, you have this option called solo mode. And I, I've become a fan of it. Like I, I wasn't crazy about it at first because I like seeing everything. I like being in control and having everything available to me. But now I don't. <laughs> so solo mode uh, basically allows you to, when you turn this on, what this does is it keeps your, your panels from being a mile long. So in other words, I have basic open right now, but let's say I wanted to go to lens correction, then it closes basic. If I wanted to go to transform, it closes lens correction. If I wanted to go back to basic, it closes all the other panels. So you're working on just the one panel at a time and you're not being distracted by all the other elements. Uh, so one panel at a time, not being distracted, solo mode. Uh, you can right click on any, any name of any panel and turn it on or turn it off. Okay, um, while we're there, and you notice that we have another option, and you can also say expand all or collapse all at any given time, even if you're in solo mode. But uh, while we're here, next tip, and when I say customize, what this lets me do, first of all, any panels you don't need or use, like you, let's say you never use the tone curve. I would recommend you try it, but let's say you just decide you never do it, then you can simply turn that off. And that way um, you don't ever see that panel anymore. It's still in Lightroom, but you don't ever see it. But the main reason I love this is because Lightroom puts things in an order that I don't work in. <laughs> so I work in basic uh, detail, lens correction, transform. But if I go to the default order, that's the order they're in. So what this lets me do is, oh, well, no, I don't want tone curve and HSL. I, I hardly ever use HSL and color. So let's move that one down to where it's, it, I still use it, but I don't use it nearly as much as the other ones. I don't use split toning nearly as much as the other ones. So this lets me put them in the order I want, and it will literally organize your panels the way you want them to be in the order you want. So um, and you can, of course, turn off the ones you want. I use effects. Oh my God, I use effects more, you know, as much as I use basic. So that should be near the top. Um, I use tone curve. I use detail probably more than tone curve. So I'm putting these in the order I want them in or use them in. And that way they're, um, they're just faster to get to. I probably use transform before I use tone curve. All right. That's, that's really my order. So now when I save that 
you know, I'd have to relaunch Lightroom to, to have it take effect. But once I relaunch Lightroom, they will be in that order. So I'll say relaunch Lightroom later. But this is the last order I put them in. And same kind of thing. Yeah, I kind of almost did the same thing. HS, HSL, hue, saturation, lightness, split toning are near the bottom because these are the ones I use the most. So therefore, they're higher up on the list. All right, uh, next up. And we're still a few minutes away from switching over to Photoshop. Let's, let's see if we can get a couple more in. Uh, reorder your panels, create smart previews. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. All right, so uh, this question comes up all the time. Normally, I show it when I'm importing, but um, people, that they ask it then. But what this feature is really designed for is, uh, if we go back to my uh, grid view, And we're there. All right. So I have, let's twirl down the navigator. Obviously, I don't have 247,000 images on any one drive. They're on, most of them are on a server on, in my closet. And that means that when I'm, uh, when I'm out and about on my laptop, I'm not taking all 247,000 with me. But that doesn't mean I don't want to work or I don't want to potentially work on some images while I'm gone, even if they're not with me. So in order to do that, if you build a smart preview while the images are connected, then you can disconnect that drive and still be able to work on them in Lightroom and even export small, small sizes of them if you need to um, and not have to worry about um, having those images with you. So how does that work after you've imported? Because I've imported and I chose smart previews, but what, how would you do it after the fact? Select as many images as you want to generate smart previews for start here go there uh, go to your library menu and then if you come down to previews you have the option to build smart previews now again this will only work while the images are connected in other words you can't do this once you leave the house and you don't have them with you because it, it doesn't have the originals to build them from so while the drive's still plugged in you can click build smart previews and it did it quick because these are already built and now you'll notice that when you click on an image it will tell you in the upper right corner here what the status is. So this is telling me I have both. I'm connected to the original. So the drive that these are on is either this local drive or my server, which I'm in, this, in the house. So it's here. And I have a smart preview. If I left the house and didn't have the original, it would just say smart preview. If I left the house, didn't have the original, and I didn't have, um, hadn't built a smart preview, it would say missing because that image is currently not available to Lightroom and therefore you can't do anything with it. Can't edit it, can't export it, can't do anything. All right, um, mentioned Lightroom um, backup, important feature. It's which one? <laughs> There's multiple ways to backup. All right, uh, so uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, Ab Abadell's asking, what's the difference between Lightroom and Lightroom Classic? A lot of differences, I covered this in like, episode one or two of the masterclass. So if you go back and watch the replays, you can really get a deep dive on what the differences are. Um, but this, let's, here's the easiest way to think about it. With Lightroom Classic, way more features because it's the older one. And you're managing the storage. So all these 247,000 images, I have to be, I have to manage where they are and I have to back them up. Uh, with Lightroom Cloud version, Every image you import gets backed up to the cloud, full resolution, JPEGs, TIFFs, um, raw files, everything. And therefore, if your hard drive crashed, you would be able to just install Lightroom again and you'd have access to all your images. That's, and not as many features. So that's the biggest differences between Lightroom Classic and Lightroom Cloud. And this version is also, the Lightroom Cloud version is also, or Lightroom is also the, same version you would have on mobile. So it looks the same, acts the same, has most of the same feature set on mobile and the web. So that's an ecosystem, as we call it. Lightroom desktop, Lightroom on iPad, Lightroom on Android, Lightroom on iPhone, Lightroom on the web, all the same feature set, all working with your backed up images and Lightroom Classic, bigger feature set, but you're managing the storage. Those are the main differences. Now, in terms of backup, uh, since, uh, since you asked, it's basically a couple different backups. There's a backup of the catalog. So when you go to your catalog settings, I have my catalogs backup once a week. And it's important because I used to not do it because I was backing up my whole computer. But backing up your whole computer 
doesn't do an integrity check on Lightroom's catalogs. This does. So when you run this, it actually checks the catalog to make sure the catalog's in good shape and repairs it if it's not, versus backing up over and over again using Time Machine or whatever backup program you use, only to be backing up a damaged catalog that can't be repaired at some point. So I still run this now once a week once I had that issue happen to me. Luckily, it was able to repair it, but it, didn't, it scared me into saying, oh, I got to run this one too. So this keeps my catalogs nice and happy and fresh. And that's, uh, that's a bonus backup tip. Um, <laughs> all right, we're, we're going to switch over to Photoshop. Let's do one more and switch over to Photoshop. Um, show. Oh, here's a, just an easy one. Let's say I wanted to know, um, like this particular photo, I think I'm working in a collection called Photography Masterclass. But what if I wanted to know what... Okay, uh, Sean's asking, let me, let me ask, answer Sean's question because it it's, it's relatively tied to the one I just gave you. So what is optimizing your catalog? Optimizing your catalog does a few things. It checks it, but it also gets rid of previews you haven't used in a while, makes the catalog smile, smaller. It's basically the same, it's the word it's, it's describing, optimizing it so that it's faster, works better, so forth and so on. So when should you optimize your, your, your catalogs? I do them weekly because it's part of the backup. But if you don't do the backup from Lightroom, then you should at least be optimizing your catalogs once every week or so. And that's, a, that's also an option under the menu. All right, uh, what about backing, uh, backing the backups up? That's a whole different topic. You should be backing up everything you, that this is in general in computers. Everything that's important to you should be in three places. One of those places should not be in the same location, meaning same house, same building, same school, same workplace, whatever. So three places, catalogs, photos, whatever, and one should be offsite, period. That's backup. So if you, as long as your images are in three places, your catalogs are in three places, everything you, that's important to you is in three places, you got a good backup strategy. If, you're, if you have to wonder if something is in more than one place, then it's not backed up. Okay. Um, so last tip, right click. And uh, if you go to go to collection, it will show you all the collections that a photo is in. So a photo can be in multiple collections without taking up space. But if you want to know which photo, which, <laughs> which collection the photo is in, just right click on the photo, go to collection and you can see them all. And maybe you're like, you're looking for other photos of that person. Maybe you put in, this one in a, in a photo, photography masterclass collection, but you want to get to the rest of the Krista pictures. So you can say, go to collection and oh, all Krista or um, the ones that Matt picked out or Krista's 11 gallery, which is probably the one from this shoot, so forth and so on. Um, same thing with showing the folder that that image is in, the actual location of it. Uh, so there we go. When should you delete old backups? when a backup wouldn't be beneficial anymore. In other words, I only usually keep the last two or three backups because a backup from six months ago, unless it was my only choice, is not gonna be helpful. I'd be using a more current backup than the one from six months ago. So after it reaches a point where if you were to restore that backup, you will have lost six months worth of work, then why do you need that backup if you have a more current one? So last couple of backups would be my choice for what I keep. And of course, if they're in multiple places, then I'm not worried about not having them. Uh, so a backup from six months ago, how's that gonna help me? I've done six months of importing and editing and so forth and so on. It would be a disaster recovery at that point. Oh, it's the only backup I have. I guess I gotta start here. So old backups, probably don't need. Okay, next up, uh, let's switch over to Photoshop. And scroll up to my Photoshop tips. So this is one that actually I didn't even know was a tip. I think I saw some some other um, some other instructor do this one. This was one that used to bug me, and it was basically if you are trying to pan around an image, you can only pan around an image by default if you're zoomed in. So for example, if I zoom in, no problem. I can move this image around. I can pan around life is good. But if I zoom out, then I can't pan the image around because 
Photoshop figures, why would you need to pan it? You can see the whole thing. And that makes sense. But believe it or not, there's sometimes I want to actually pan the image. I want to scroll it even though it's zoomed out. So there's a preference for that because everything's a preference. Preference uh, tools, and there's something called over scroll. If you enable over scroll, click OK. Now you can pan around an image that you're that's zoomed all the way out. So I want to move that over for some reason because maybe I want to do something over here. I don't know. But there are times where I'm like frustrated that I can't move an image because it's zoomed all the way out. Now that's gone. All right. Um, next up is let's close this one. And let's see if I have a good example here. This one might work. I haven't tried this yet, so we'll see. Uh, my one of my other favorite features is Content Aware Crop. So it's it's and it's a tip. It's basically the way the crop tool has multiple options. So if I go to crop, first of all, first tip is that you have the option to get rid of the pixels you delete or do a non-destructive crop, meaning don't delete the pixels. So if I do a non-destructive crop, that's then this is a bonus tip by the way. And I say I don't want that distraction over there. I don't even know what that is. And then I click OK, and then later somebody comes back and say, wait, you you cut off the part where we're showing how we're building a new building in the corner, whatever reason. All right, so <laughs> that that would be something that I want back. And once it's cropped, normally it would be gone once I save it. But if I go back to the crop tool, because I did not delete uh, cropped pixels, oh, wrong tool, uh, there it is. Uh, and I can always go back and uncrop. But you notice also that the crop lets me go out. It lets me go away from the image. That also gives me the ability to either add canvas space. So if I just do this, let's say I do it on this side, then what I'm saying is just add some space. So when I click OK, if it's added space. I can put something there. That's fine. But let's undo that because if I turn on content aware at the very top while I'm in the crop tool, then what I'm telling Photoshop to do is fill the image with more image. So let's say I need to add some text over here. I can just simply say, click OK. I don't know how this is going to work because I haven't tried on this image before. But now it's 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 giving me a progress bar because it's it's saying, oh, you want me to fill that area with some more of this area. And it actually did a very nice job. <laughs> and now you've got more image. So this will really help you when you need an image to fit in a space that it's not conducive to because of the proportions of the image versus the proportions of the space. Now you can go in and actually get it to look pretty much where it needs to be for the space you're doing. All right. Um, let's see what else. Let's go on to the next one. Content aware crop. All right. Um, this is just a kind of a, a just a, a, a beginner tip. And a lot of beginners get wrapped up into maybe you were using a tool like the patch tool. So you, you, you made a selection over there and then you zoomed in and you wanted to uh, maybe use, I don't know, sharpen and you notice nothing's happening. Or maybe you want to use a paintbrush. Um, we go to the B for the paintbrush and you really notice nothing's happening. Like that should be brushing blue. How come nothing's happening? It's because you have that selection still active way up here in the corner, wherever it is. All right, so that selection is still active. So whenever you get into a situation, you don't have to zoom out. You don't have to figure out where did I accidentally leave something selected. Just, let me go to my brush again. So I start brushing. Nothing's happening. Command D for deselect. PC, Control D for deselect. Now I can paint. Because it will just, wherever there's a selection, it will deselect it. I don't have to remember where it is. I don't have to know where it is. I don't have to see it. Just simply hit Command D. If something's not working, it's usually because you have something still selected, and therefore you can just do it. All right, we don't want to paint blue, but anyway, if if a tool's not working, I immediately just hit Command D because I assume it's not working because I still have something selected from before. All right, next up, um, when you're running filters, let's say I want to adjust the tone of this. I can go up to any filter and, and start doing stuff. But if I want to do it non-destructively, then you should do convert for smart filters. Because convert for smart filters will turn this into a smart object. 
And therefore, now when I go and run something like uh, Camera Raw Filter, which is one of my favorites, and I go in, notice Camera Raw Filter still sees the rest of the image. And I go in and I just do an auto tone on this image because I think it's a little too bright. There we go. And maybe bring up the shadows a bit more. There we go. And now when I click OK, everything I just did happened in a smart object or on a smart filter. So if I, A, don't want this anymore, just turn it off. I get back to the washed out version that I now see from Adobe Stock. If I want to uh, get back to it, I turn it back on. And more importantly, the most important part of this is not that it's just you can turn it off, turn it on, or delete it. You can double click and get right back to your same sliders. So uh, I can say, well, I didn't really want to make the, uh, the vibrance as high. Uh, maybe I, I did want to increase the shadows even more, so forth and so on. And I get right back to where I was instead of having to start from scratch every single time. So convert for smart filters. And if you ever need to get into editing the actual pixels of the image, because when you're on a smart object, it restricts you from doing certain things. So for example, um, if I go to my, I'm on my paintbrush, notice I can't paint. I'm getting the no symbol because that would be destructive. Adding paint would be changing the pixels. So I either A, have to do it on a new layer, or B, double click to get into the actual image. Notice it's still washed out. Now I can paint because now I am editing what's inside that smart object container. So when I close the image, I'm back to the smart object um, and, and I can affect it as long as I do anything non-destructively. But if I want to edit the pixels, I have to either convert it for not to a regular pixel layer or get back into the pixel layer to make any changes that I want to make. All right, uh, next up. Uh, this is kind of a cool one. Let's see if I have an example of it. Or maybe not. Maybe we'll just make an example of it. All right, so I'm just I'm going to add a couple more layers, just random layers for the sake of example. Uh, we'll just make this Q&A one down here. We'll put this one down here on the grass. All right, and we'll add another layer really quickly. Let's add a, add a lion, <laughs> just because. A baby lion. All right, there we go. All right, and we'll line those up. Cool. Uh, and I'm just putting random layers in. All right, the reason I'm putting random layers in is because um, one of my other favorite, and let's do one more, actually. Let's put something else in here. Uh, we'll put a camera in. All right, these, these obviously have nothing to do with each other, but I've got these layers in here now. What I can do is select multiple layers. I just held down the shift key or you can shift click multiple layers. And then I can create what's called a layer group or um, yeah, what's called create a new, create a new group. So when I create a group, I can double click and name that group and I can call it random, <laughs> random photos. And now that I've got that group selected, I can treat it as one layer. So for example, if I grab the move tool and I start moving based on the group, they all move. If I free transform, they all free transform. They all get smaller, they all get moved around. If I lower the opacity of the group, they all get lower opacity. But I still have control over the individual images. So if I just want to lower the opacity of the lion, I can. Or if I just want to move the lion image, I, oh, as long as they're not still selecting group. Ah, because auto select is on, stop. Okay, so now I can just go in and move um, individual pieces of the group without affecting the rest. So a group is great when you want to treat things as one thing but you don't want to really group the link or link the layers together. And you want to size, you want to output, you want to do all kinds of things. You can do that as a group, but you still have individual control over the individual layers anytime you want. All right, so that's creating a layer, creating and using layer groups. Uh, next up on my list, ooh, this is a good one. Let's get out of this image, we're done with it. Let's say, I'm just looking for a stock image here. All right, yeah, we'll use the puppy. All right, let's say we, um, 
we want to liquefy the puppy for some reason. <laughs> we want to maybe push over the spur a little bit. So when you go into liquefy, which also you could do a smart filter for, so it's, it's non-destructive. So let's do that. When you go into uh, liquefy, there is a, uh, and normally your, your, um, your options are turned up like this. What you want to do, this is the tip, you want to go into your brush tool options and you want to make sure pin edges is checked or enabled because that's an important tip. It will help you not make a mistake. And what do I mean by making a mistake? Without that checked, if I were to start uh, going over here and I make a brush that's maybe too big and I start pushing over parts of the uh, fur to make it line up better, and then I accidentally, let me make sure I'm, yeah, I'm on the edge. I accidentally pull in from the edge. And it won't be that obvious, obviously. It'll be something really small. But you end up making a gap in your photo and someone says, aha, they use liquify. I can tell because their image is cur curved in or bent in from the edges. So undo, 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 undo. And pin edges. Now... Even if I go to the edge itself, I cannot make a gap. I can make it distorted, but I cannot leave a hole. I cannot do anything that would leave an obvious hole. I can still make it obvious, but it won't be a hole in my image because the Im the edges are pinned to the edge. So, um, and by the way, uh, when you have a pattern like this, you want to use a small brush so that it's not so obvious that what you're doing. You want to be right close to the to what you're pushing as opposed to liquefying all of this, that would be obvious. So that's, oh, and also pay attention to lines, keep them straight, five tips. All right, uh, you've been noticing uh, another tip I've been using all along, and that's been um, Creative Cloud Libraries. So you have this Libraries panel in Photoshop. You can um, create new libraries. I have dozens, if not like hundreds of libraries. Create a new library, call it whatever you want. And then you can add layers, add images, add things to your library that will that you'll use over and over again. So I have this, this one called Adobe Stock, which has lots of stock images that I use from time to time for demos just like this. Uh, of course, you don't have to use Adobe Stock. You can put your own images in there. So one of the bonus tips is that if I go to a different library, let's go pick a different one. Let's go pick Adobe Live 2020. So this is the one I've been using for this year. Uh, and by the way, your library can be categorized. So those are all the graphics. Now, if I want to add this one image that I've been working on to this one library, I can just either drag it over or I can just hit the plus sign and add either the color or the, the foreground color or the graphic or um, create, uh, create, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, it's basically capture built into Photoshop. Uh, and also if it's a multi-layered Photoshop file, you can create a new library from that multi-layered file. But I'm just gonna add it as a graphic that I'll put at the top of the graphics. You can rename it. And so now that puppy image is in this, in its full resolution in this library from now on. And that library does, yeah, if you hold on to shift key, Sean, you can get straight brush strokes with just about anything, including liquify. All right, so uh, that's one thing. But people always saying, do I have to open up every single image that I want to put in a library and you know hit plus sign every single time? And here's kind of a bonus tip that a lot of people don't realize you can do. Uh, let me go out to my operating system. Remember these pictures of Krista, which I think they're, I don't know if they're all the same. They're all the same. All right, so let's say that I want to, let's add 10 images here that I want to put in a library. Uh, you can, why is that one? That one got renamed. But anyway, you can drag and drop from the operating system into a library multiple images. So I can drag 100 images into a library right from the operating system and they will start to sync up. So that way you don't have to open them and add them one by one by one by one. Uh, you can do it as a group. You can populate a library from 1,000 images just by dragging them in and it will do it. Okay, next up, um, well, while I mentioned it, let's do it while we have the puppy image open. So you also have the ability, let's go to this one, you have the ability, or I had the ability, uh, let's undo, 
Let me see. Let me wait, 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 wait. Let's go ahead. I just want to open up a different one here. There we go. You have the ability to create from image. Um, so I opened up this cupcake. It's already transparent background. Great. It's in my library ready to use. But let's say I really, really like that red on that cherry. And I really, really like that yellow on the frosting. Then what I could do is click create from image. And that will bring up capture what we know as Capture on our phones, which is a mobile app, free to download and use, you've got a version of it built into Photoshop. So I can capture it, make it a pattern, and I can adjust how that pattern looks and, and adjust part what part of the image it uses and so forth and so on. I can go make it a vector shape and save to my library, and I can that will be vectors that I can use. I can also get the colors. So I can get the red from that, I can get the yellow from that part of the frosting, and I can get the brown from the bottom part of the actual cake, I can get the blue that's on that one little piece of candy right there, and there's a black one somewhere I can maybe get, um, what color do I want left? All right, we'll get the white or the gray from there. All right, so now I've made a color theme from the cupcake. So I'll have all these colors to use and I hit save to my library and it will um, save it and I can get out of this, close it. And now that that color theme is there and I can use those colors for all the rest of my design. Mallory, didn't know this existed. How did you uh, capture? On your library panel, click the plus sign, create from image or download Adobe Capture on iOS or Android and use it on your devices. And they will sync to the same libraries. All right, next up, because you really, you want to capture things while you're out and about. That's why the mobile app's important. Um, all right, uh, let's say that I want to change the color of that cherry. So I'm going to, first of all, use my object selection tool to select the cherry, and hopefully it's stem. Um, this would probably be better with a rectangle. And let's just go ahead and make a selection just like that. All right, so object selection tool did a decent job of selecting just the cherry. If I zoom in, you can see that selection. Great. And now I want to change the color of it. So one of the easiest ways of changing the color, <laughs> never go anywhere. Yeah, we never go anywhere anymore, I know. Um, now that one of the easiest ways of changing the color is using a hue and saturation adjustment. So if I go to hue and saturation, First and foremost, I can just change the hue and whatever select it will get changed. So if I wanted a, a pink cherry or purple cherry or blue cherry or green cherry, I can do that as well. And you can also click colorize and that way you're dragging to the specific color that you want. Um, so you have multiple ways of uh, affecting quickly, easily and non-destructively the color of something by using a color <laughs> adjustment. Uh, I'm sorry my dessert choices are making you uh, hungry. All right, and with that said, that is our last tip because I just looked and we're out of time. I'm going to get cut off in a second. All right, so uh, thanks for watching me. Uh, we'll continue with more.